Vladimir Putin has ruined the future of Russia. The war has to end. There has to be reparations and there has to be democratic government before we can ever look at Russia the same again. This was said by the head of global Minsky justice campaign, Bill Pona, when interviewed by Hero News. So I'd like to think how sometimes people forget that laws are made by people asking whether it's legal to take Russian funds. Forget the fact that people decide what's legal, not the other way around. Putin certainly doesn't care about laws, but his own power. A law-abiding culture must adapt their own laws when fighting someone whose only limits are what his power allows. This is a great reminder from Bill and you can be able to see the rest of his interview from Era News. Hello and welcome to the Global Conversation. My guest today is Bill Browder, the businessman, Kremlin critic, and author of the book Freezing Order. Bill Browder was here in the European Parliament in Brussels last week, speaking at an event called Make Russia Pay, an event all about using frozen Russian assets in order to reconstruct Ukraine. Thank you so much, Bill Browder, for being our guest here on The Global Conversation. Welcome to your own news. Just in case our viewers are not familiar with you, you're the American British um, investor, also the head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign. That's a human rights movement in honor of your friend and former lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who was murdered back in 2009 at just the age of 37. Well, it's great to be here. Um, uh, I've been on a mission uh, since he was murdered 13 years ago to get justice for him, and uh, that's led to uh, traveling all over the world, um, uh, meeting with lawmakers, specifically to get a law passed called the Magnitsky Act, which freezes the assets and bans the visas of the people who killed him and do similar types of things. The Magnitsky Act now uh, has been passed in 35 countries around the world, including um, 27 countries of the European Union. Uh, and the Magnitsky Act is the template which is now being used to sanction oligarchs and other Putin regime officials around the world. And so it's, um, it, I, I mean, I would have never imagined both the effect of the Magnitsky Act and, and, and sadly the need for the Magnitsky Act with what Putin has done. Well, indeed, it was in 2020, I believe, the EU approved it. Is it working? Well, the EU um, has, uh, so the United States passed the Magnitsky Act in 2012. It took the EU another eight years to do it. Um, there's a lot of dysfunction in the EU. Um, it's the lowest common denominator type of organization where, like, Hungary, for example, didn't want it to happen for many years, and so it couldn't happen until we could overcome that hurdle. The Magnitsky Act has been used, um, but it hasn't been used to the extent it should be used. The EU has been, again, very, um, very much of a, a consensus organization, or I should say a, a veto organization where one country can veto the whole situation. So, um, well, the Americans are always amazed about how long it takes for things to happen right here in the European Union. Speaking of which, we heard recently the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, promise or put a proposal on the table to confiscate the assets, uh, frozen assets of Russian oligarchs and use that to reconstruct Ukraine. But my question to you, is that legally possible? Well, so there, there's two types of assets. There's the oligarch assets and then there's the Russian state assets um, that have been frozen. The Russian state assets amount to $350 billion. And um, it seems to me that the Russian state assets is like an open and shut case. You have a, a, a country that's committed an act of aggression, a crime of aggression. I don't think anyone, anyone, you don't have to, it's very easy to prove, you just turn on your television set. You can quantify the damages that the Russians have done to Ukraine uh, at more than a trillion dollars. And you have possession of the 350 billion. Now there's all sorts of, um, uh, bureaucrats and other people saying, oh, you can't do that, it, it's not right, it's, it violates this or that. We're in a world where we have to adapt the laws for the times. Um, Putin is adapting the crimes to a new, uh, he, he's, he's creating a new era of crimes, and so we have to adapt the laws to come into, uh, into effect for that. And so here we are in a lawmaking body at the European Parliament, um, and it's not just here that I go, I've been in the British Parliament and the U.S. Congress and Canadian Parliament and so on, and um, all, in all these institutions, this is what you do, you make laws. 
And so um, uh, to the extent that there are any um, legal deficiencies, I think that the, the key to fixing that is to say, OK, let's pass a new law to close that loophole so that Putin can't go around murdering Ukrainians and not paying a price. And Vladimir Putin, obviously a man you know well. You used to be, in fact, his friend, and then you became his, quote, biggest enemy. I was never his friend. I've, I've never actually met Vladimir Putin. Um, at, at the very beginning of his presidency, our interests were aligned when he was going after the oligarchs. He then became the biggest oligarch himself. And after that, um, we, we became arch enemies. And, and when I passed the Magnitsky Act, um, he was so angry with me, you can't even imagine. He's been chasing me around the world with, there's been eight Interpol arrest warrants, extradition requests. Even at the, at the Trump Helsinki summit in 2018, um, he asked Trump to hand me over. Um, he's really been obsessed with me since, since the Magnitsky Act. He's obsessed with you, and therefore you can never set your foot ever back in Russia again. Well, they want me back desperately in Russia because um, uh, they've issued all these arrest warrants for me. They want to bring me back to Russia. They want to torture me and they want to kill me. And Vladimir Putin, were you surprised when he invaded Ukraine? I, I was actually surprised. Now, I wasn't surprised that he has the capacity to murder or do terrible harm. But I was surprised because Vladimir Putin, he's kind of in a weak position. His country is not a great economy. The economy is the size of New York State. Um, he, his military budget is about the same as, as the UK's military budget. And he steals about, or his people steal about 80% of that. And so I, I never thought that, that he, he would want to put on like the full, you know, Russian military insignia and then show his face and do that. He, he, everything he's always done before the, the invasion has been plausibly deniable. You know, he sent a bunch of um, guys with uniforms and, and, and uh, into Ukraine without their insignia in, in, in 2014 and said, oh, they were just uh, tourists. They go and poison some people in Salisbury. The, they're just looking at cathedrals. Uh, that, that's his, that, that has been his normal style of, of crime, not, not, you know, with the full, you know, uh, regalia of, of Russian military going into a foreign country. And what about here? We're in Brussels, the heart of the European Union. The West and, of course, the EU have introduced a lot of sanctions against on Russia. Are they working, though, do you think? Well, the sanctions on Russia are working, but there's a lot of places where Russia hasn't been sanctioned. Um, up until very recently, up until Monday of this week, uh, they were making a billion dollars a day from the sale of oil and gas. So it's great that we've frozen the central bank reserves, great that we've frozen oligarch assets, but if they're making a billion dollars a day and they're spending a billion dollars a day killing Ukrainians, you know, that's not working. So on Monday this week, the oil price cap was put in place, which says that, that Russia, nobody can buy oil um, at a higher price than $60 a barrel, and unless they can prove that they're imposing that, then they can't get insurance on their ships. And so as of a few moments ago, uh, Russian oil exports are down 50 percent. Let, let's see if that lasts. And just on the oligarchs, the, the billionaires, I mean, your job as well in the past was to name them and to shame them. Do you think they're being hurt by these sanctions? Definitely. The oligarchs are finished and they're an uh, uh, endangered species now. They, they can't open bank accounts anywhere in the world. They can't travel. They can't do business with anyone. There uh, used to be there that every the jewelry dealer and concierge and, and so on was, was, you know, bowing to them, you know, wanting their business, you know, just making them feel like they're the most important people in the world. Now they're toxic, radioactive. Nobody wants to touch them. And what about the future of Russia and the future of uh, West Russian relations and the European Union going forward? I think Vladimir Putin has ruined uh, the future of Russia for the next 30 years. I think that this is a, a country which is now a pariah state, a terrorist state. First the war has to end, then there has to be reparations then there has to be a democratic government before we can ever look at Russia the same again. And what would be your message to him? Step down before we, before the West and your own people force you to step down. Okay. Bill Breder, thank you so much. A pleasure to have you here on the Global Conversation on your own news. Thank you.